and welcome back everyone. I'm here with our distinguished guests here, the Professor uh, Jung Weiwei and Daniel Dumbrell. And just before we went to break, uh, I kind of cut Daniel off a little bit and I know he was wanting to make a, a point here. Daniel, back over to you. <laughs> yeah, no, actually I was just hoping that uh, Professor Zhang could repeat a story that he told during the Nexus Forum about his predictions about what Western democracies would produce in the absence of having this meritocracy-based system. Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, at the next debate, I was recalling my debate with Professor Fukuyama, the author of The End of History and Last Man. That was, uh, uh, that take, took place in 11 years ago, in the year 2011, in Shanghai. And he said, you know, China needs to have a political reform to adopt the multi-party system, one person, one vote. I said that both China and United States need political reform. But I said, United States need more political reforms and more urgently. Why? Because I say your system, from my study, is a product of pre-industrial era. And then I made a prediction. I said, without substantial political reform, my concern is you may elect a leader worse off than George W. Bush. Mm. It turned out to be true. <laughs> you know, let's not kid our audience here. We know that there is a stereotype that the Western audiences have on democracy in China. Um, I want to go back to you, Professor. Um, the stereotyped impression of China uh, in the West, we even have politicians, even as yeah. of yesterday, we had yeah. the UK government two people that are running yes, to be sure. prime minister of the government came out very strong yeah. with uh, their opinions and their narratives yeah. on China. What, do we have some advice to them? Uh, the problem is uh, with the Western media and the Western uh, 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 politicians, this uh, stereotyped view of China is largely shaped by uh, this uh, uh, Cold War ideological uh, uh, line of thinking. As a result, it's always along the line of democracy versus autocracy, democracy versus authoritarianism. I think this is very much outdated. I put forward this uh, new paradigm. I said, your paradigm is outdated. It's a cold war. It's already outdated. I would suggest we have a replacement. That is good governance versus bad governance. Yeah. You have to test the quality of a political system by measuring to what extent you can ensure good governance. And then this good governance is measured by the opinions of your own people. As I'll give you 10, 15, 20 opinion surveys conducted by Western reputable international service agencies. Because whether PW, whether uh, Ipsos or Harvard Kennedy School, all this in uh, long-term uh, systematic surveys suggest that most Chinese, around 90 percent, some 85, some 91, 92 percent, think their country is on the right track. But if you look at the results for the United States, for UK, I'm sorry, it's always around 40, 30 percent, sometimes even 20 percent. In the case of the United States today, uh, I read the latest uh, uh, survey by New York Times, 75 percent people think their country, the United States, is on the wrong track. You know, Professor, uh, the Western audience, some of the viewers might think that these numbers in China, when you start getting into the 90% mm. support, mm. they might feel that these numbers are fabricated. The viewers <laughs> might feel they're fabricated. But I think that there's something that I've noticed here in the last few months is governments being replaced in Europe. Just mm. recently, Mario Draghi's government in mm. Italy could mm. not form yeah. a government and had to resign. Yeah. We are seeing other governments under pressure. The United Kingdom is now having another election for a new prime minister. Mm. These numbers that you spoke about, mm. uh, over 90%, how can we convince or tell our Western audience it's that these easy. numbers are real? Yeah. No, uh, in the first place, we have our own service. Uh, second, as I said, China is a civilizational state which means it's an amalgamation of hundreds of states into one of its long history. And uh, that's why, you know, uh, if you see China's one-party system, I tell you very honestly, China has been under kind of one-party system for over 2,000 years, since 2 to 1. 
BC, when China was first unified, China practiced what I call unified ruling entity. Otherwise, the country disintegrated and broke apart. So why this figure is so convincing? Because very easy, it's about the central government. The Chinese central government always has a very high reputation. It's never the major problem. If China's central government has an opinion survey, say, support approval rate of 50%, China will be deep crisis. Mm. So Point. there is a saying in China since ancient times called the uh, emperor cannot be wrong. A local officials can be wrong. Yeah. So it's also one way to release pressure. If there is a problem, people say, ah, this bureau chief or this county chief, they are problem. They did not listen to Xi Jinping, you know. So the central government was a vast country. It's about 30, 40 times the size of Canada in terms of population. Yes, you know? of course. Yeah. So uh, that's how even in China's uh, long history, most ordinary Chinese don't want to see a change of government every four years. No, this is inconceivable, the Chinese mentality. This government, this CPC is the institution. Otherwise, the country broke apart. We experienced warlords fighting each other after we adopted American political system in the 1911 Republican Revolution. That, that, th those numbers you're talking about also can be reflected in studies that were done overseas by the Harvard Ash Institute also, yeah. um, which was quite a long study. And it's the same thing, it showed the central government, support for central, central government was extremely high, well over 90%. It started going down a bit as you got to local governments, but still they were levels that Western governments could only dream of for approval ratings. Um, and uh, then there was a York University in Canada that did a follow-up study also that kind of confirmed the same things. And it doesn't take much effort when you're here on the ground talking to people um, to, to, to really see that. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be periods of time where there's ups and downs or there's certain issues that need to be resolved, but overall it's pretty observable. And, and I view a lot of, you know, government's contribution in how making people's lives better. Yeah. You know, us being here in Chongqing, yeah. you can just see, you yeah. visited the yeah. city a few yeah. years ago, even in two or three years yeah. the city has put a, a vast amount yeah. of resources into yeah. its infrastructure, yeah. whether it's expanding its rail lines, whether it's connecting other cities closer yeah. to really helping people, yeah. alleviating poverty. Now, uh, before you came on the show today, uh, Daniel and I met up before the show and we were really uh, excited to ask you a lot of questions. Last night, Daniel and I were putting some <laughs> notes together. Yeah. I'm gonna pass it over uh, to my good colleague here, Daniel, <laughs> to, he's got a couple of questions he would like to Please. ask you and uh, let's, let's yeah, send it I, to you. Yeah, I guess uh, some of the things for people to understand with this, uh, you just have to look at what's going on, right? You just see with poverty alleviation and you see in the numbers. Um, it's amazing to see that other countries uh, have all these domestic issues going on, uh, wealth in inequality going up, um, continually going up, but still trying to say that China needs to adopt their political system. Um, and the I, I like what Eric Lee once said, your friend uh, Eric Lee, he said, um, you know, in China, you can't change the party, but you can change the policies. In the West, you can change the party, but you can't change the policies. And it goes back to what I was saying, everything remains the same. But what he was also talking about was he looked at what was it that actually makes a country rich? And uh, in Dambisa Moyo, I showed you, showed you some of Dambisa yeah. Moyo's videos also, where it actually shows that it's not political freedoms that is a prerequisite for economic success, it's economic success that's a prerequisite for, um, for a democratic systems. And they say even with the examples of you know, uh, Korea and Taiwan, they attained, uh, they reached development under basically a dictatorship before they democratized. So uh, what I wanted to ask you about was your idea for developing countries. Now, I know that you would never recommend your system for, you know, mm -hmm. Chinese system for Western countries, but what about developing countries that have been continually struggling under uh, what we say as, as democracies, but uh, probably I should also add that Dan Bisa Moy also said that it's shown that 70% of them are illiberal democracies. They, they lack basic freedoms. So uh, long question short, like what, what would your recommendation be to developing countries in terms of political models? And uh, I first uh, uh, published an article on uh, the Chinese model may work much better than US model for developing world it was uh, 16 years back. <laughs> I wrote a piece called The Allure of the Chinese Model uh, for International Herald Tribune, now part of the New York Times. I said I've traveled to over 
100 countries, most of the developing ones, I came with a very uh, simple conclusion that the American model not working for the poor countries and the China model would be much better. I said this openly. At that time, you know, the New York Times or Herald Tribune has a lot of confidence in their political system. Mm. They publish my opinion piece. That's fine. It's uh, <laughs> that. Now's a different story. Yeah, now's a different <laughs> story. Yeah. Basically, I said the uh, key message from the Chinese model is uh, whatever you do, political policy, economic policy, social policy, you should all end up in delivering tangible goods to the ordinary people. We call this people's livelihood approach. Whatever you do, then something strongly against what he called the talking shop, talking for the sake of talking, like Obama. He was already not a bad president, but uh, he was in power for eight years. Mm. He came to power with the slogan, change. But after eight years, no change. Yeah. <laughs> so in China, that's inconceivable. Everything, you have to improve people's living standards, yes. both material and non-material. This from Asian tradition, focus on people's livelihood. So that is the number one. In other words, if we follow the China model, you each refer to China model, what we do, very simple, you do all kinds of surveys to know what people want most. In, they want you know, whatever, uh, pension, medical insurance, job creation, fighting crime, and you do this accordingly, one, two, three, four. So I was uh, joking with the FCC in Hong Kong, Foreign Correspondents Club. I said, uh, now the United States became a surreal country. You cannot solve problems, you know, whether gun control, abortion rights, infrastructure, drug issue. I said, China system is about solving problems. Yeah, identify problems, find the causes, and then fix a, a formula and try to fix it within a deadline, one year, two years, or three months. It's done, you know. So we're a country run by, some people say, by engineers, problem-oriented, resolving problems. But the U.S. system, I don't know. I asked uh, the correspondent, uh, Miss, uh, I said, uh, do you think you can solve the problem of gun control in the next 100 years? <laughs> he said, no. <laughs> yeah. No way. I wonder if you think that that's part of the reason why there's such a hyper-focus on China from these foreign governments, is to also distract their people and make it about, you know, problems somewhere else. Uh, one key difference between the Chinese political system and the Western political system is that we don't blame others. We think the problem has both uh, maybe domestic reason and foreign reason. Then we try to focus first of all on domestic reason. What's wrong with our problem? What our side of the problem we try to solve? This is very much Confucianism. You, know, you always uh, do introspection to see the Confucianism you should do three times a day. You know, what you have done wrong, whatever. So, so with this kind of culture, uh, yes, we are maybe less good in uh, promoting China's image abroad, but we're doing very well in resolving China's problems. We're making faster progress. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, I want to don't blame that. I, I want to mention, because you've seen it too, though, yeah. uh, the, the, the ridiculousness of this kind of blame game and shifting yeah. attention. The most epic example I saw was of a video someone made where they said, so Roe versus Wade, what's China's involvement? What's China's <laughs> Chinese true. government's involvement? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to jump in and add my context yeah. into this is that yeah. if you ask Chinese that are yeah. coming back to China yeah. from abroad, yeah. what is their, what, what yeah. is bringing them back here yeah. now? Yeah. Is it now they've realized that mm. when they've went out into these countries mm. that the system has broken down? Mm. It could be anything. It could, you know, I have a, a lot of colleagues that have come back from yeah. uh, America yeah. to China and they say, boy, it's not what I thought when I yeah. left. Uh, and I get into conversations, well, yeah. what seems to bother you? Well, the infrastructure's not there. I expected mm. the yeah. airports to be better. Yeah. And they start at the airport yeah. and then they eventually get around to, yeah. I don't feel safe mm. right. yeah. or, yeah the medical system yeah. isn't there for me. If something yeah. happened to me, I'm afraid to go to the doctor. Now this comes all the way around to a point I'm gonna make in this, mm -hmm. uh, in this interview here. China's COVID policy is viewed by a lot of Western governments as draconian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Even though over 180 of these countries had a failed COVID policy, and we call it the just let it rip policy where they just <laughs> let it go. They've yeah. lost control of it. Yeah. Was there 
Or is there any other way yeah. for China to change its current policy? On no, this? basically what we call uh, dynamic clearance, not exactly the zero uh, uh, COVID. So dynamic clearance is a very successful model. But the Chinese model is also what we saw keeping with the changing times. If other countries can show their model is working better, we'll learn from it. But so far, we haven't seen that. Whether Europe or United States, they have this uh, whatever, uh, uh, accept the reality. But in the end, you don't see economic growth. China, at least you have economic growth. At the same time, this uh, uh, policy. Behind this is different culture and philosophy. Our philosophy, our culture is very much based on a balance between rights and responsibilities. There must be balance. I see it's very much 21st century. We are going to face with many challenges. You have to have this balance. You only talk about individual rights, uh, uh, not your responsibility. That will be damaging, not only for yourself, also for your country, for your society. And I think for in the case of Shanghai, we experienced this uh, two months uh, lockdown. Uh, of course, China, Shanghai should have done uh, better, uh, even much better, because uh, Shenzhen has done well. Lockdown for 10 days, it's over. And Wuhan has done well, Tianjin has done well. And, uh, but the China mode on the whole is very successful. Uh, I said this many times on TV, in debate with foreign correspondents, uh, with FCC, I said, look at Hong Kong. You lost close to 10,000 lives. New York, 70,000 lives. Shanghai, 500 lives. So no comparison, and your populations are much smaller. And Ch other Chinese cities are done better than Shanghai. So yes, two months lockdown is a bit inconvenient, but on the other hand, the whole country is safe. Your neighborhood is safe. Now we are very safe. Mm -hmm. So this is a kind of a balance between rights and responsibilities. China model is not perfect, but as a civilization of state. Whatever we do, I always said, you know, that's also Deng Xiaoping's thinking. You always have the, the part of strategy and the part of tactics. Because it's a huge country. If your strategy is right, dynamic clearance is right, then tactics can be adjusted and changed and uh, uh, reformed. Don't worry about this. So Shah has been changing, adjusting its tactics, but the overall strategy is good, it's solid. It's much, much better than American strategy. I, I, would, I would like to yeah. actually go to Daniel on this. Yeah. And uh, I did follow Daniel's channel during uh, the outbreak. Mm -hmm. And that's how I kind of met Daniel as he was I documenting see. all see. of this going on during the time. Uh, maybe you could add a little bit to this, Daniel, on um, what you feel as a, a Westerner living mm -hmm. where you were living during this outbreak. And yeah, I mean, in the, in the beginning in uh, Shenzhen, we, had, we were in Nanshan district, which uh, was getting pretty, uh, pretty serious at one point. I, we, we, nobody really knew what this was or how bad it was going to be. So we were all scared and we were all like, we just got to do this. We could have locked down for even longer and it would have been okay. I can also understand if somebody was stuck in Shanghai during that lockdown, that now they would feel less than optimistic about the policies. Uh, but the, the nature of it is, is that you do have to take a step back and take a look and think that if we just do let it rip here, this is inevitably going to mean millions of deaths. And also there's long-term consequences that people are not sure about too. There's people who have long COVID. My aunt, uh, who lives between New Jersey and New York, uh, she caught it very early on in, I think it was 2020. She still hasn't fully recovered. When she can't walk up the stairs like she used to anymore. The, the long-term effects of COVID include uh, cognitive issues, respiratory, and even reproductive. So we're dealing still with something that's gonna have, you know, probably some long-term studies that we don't know how it's gonna affect these entire populations. Um, and then once again, you, you have to accept, if you're gonna let it rip, that's gonna be millions and millions of deaths. A lot of people are going to lose their grandparents. You're going to have to, you're going to have to, you know. So when you take a step back and you look at that and you say, okay, all right, Shanghai to lock down for two months, you know, make me, you know, I'm just glad I'm not in the position to have to make these decisions. <laughs> you know, it's it's a tough decision for the. You yeah, know. and uh, uh, as I said, the China civilizational country, the Chinese Communist Party, and the Chinese state 
is responsible for the continuation of this civilization. It's a lot of responsibility. If you look at the United States, today its life expectancy is lower than China's because of COVID. Mm. One million lives lost. Now United States, China is 77.9, United States 77. So in two years, are really different. So you can't imagine if China adopt the American policy, what would have happened? Staggering yeah. numbers. Yeah, it will be much, much worse. So we're going to take a bit of a break here and we're going to carry on with our discussion here after the break. We look forward to seeing you back. <laughs>